Hi, I'm Huey Lin, Director of the Houston Methodist Adult Congenital Heart Program. Welcome to Houston Methodist Congenital Heart Awareness Week 2020, Cases with Experts. With us today is Dr. Valeria Duarte, my partner in adult congenital heart disease. She's also a specialist in cardiovascular imaging in congenital heart disease, as well as a specialist in pregnancy and cardiovascular disease. Also with us is Dr. B. Keith Ellis, Chair of Cardiovascular Diseases at Houston Methodist Sugarland. Dr. Duarte. Thank you, Dr. Lin. Thank you for joining us today um, as, we, as we start our uh, Houston Methodist Congenital Heart Disease uh, Awareness Week in 2020. Um, I, we are going to dis briefly discuss a case of a patient that we took care of not too long ago, and we partnered with the Houston Methodist Sugarland, and Dr. Ellis is going to help me present. Dr. Ellis? Thank you, Dr. Lynn and Dr. Duarte. It's a pleasure to be on this panel with you here today. Uh, our first case is a 61-year-old gentleman uh, who presented to our clinic at Houston Methodist Sugarland with shortness of breath. Uh, he had symptoms for quite a while, but they came on in a very subtle fashion, and he compensated himself uh, subjectively. Uh, he was seen by a pulmonology colleague and was found to have oxygen desaturations at night and was subsequently prescribed nocturnal oxygen. He later underwent a CT angiogram, which was concerning for a sinus venosus ASD and anomalous pulmonary venous return. So with this in mind, um, he was evaluated further and he was referred for a cardiac MRI to obtain more information about this defect. A cardiac MRI was performed and it demonstrated here, if you follow, this is a cross-sectional image across the chest. Um, this is anterior, this is posterior. And we can see here the left atrium and uh, this structure here is the SVC. Um, this is a pulmonary vein as it's coming towards the, the left atrium. And you can see that there, there is a defect, a communication between the blue blood coming through the SVC and the red blood, oxygenated blood, coming uh, with, uh, through the pulmonary veins to the left atrium. Um, so this is what a sinus venosus ASD is. It's it's a more complex type of ASD. Um, MRI, cardiac MRI not only helps us with the diagnosis, but it also helps us quantify what amount of flow is going through this defect that we have identified. And we do that by measuring something called the QPQS, which in, in this case was 2.3. So let's review a little more uh, of the ASD physiology. So as you know, the, this is a box diagram of the heart. The heart has four chambers and is divided into left and right structures by the septum. Uh, the septum divides the right atrium, the upper chambers, the right atrium and the left atrium. And this piece of the septum is called the interatrial septum. And the lower piece of the septum divides the right ventricle from the left ventricle and is called the interventricular septum. So let's, let's follow the blood throw, flow through the heart, okay? The, the right-sided structures are divided by a valve, the tricuspid valve, and the left-sided structures are divided by the, the mitral valve. The blue blood comes to the right side of the heart um, through two large veins, the IVC and the SVC, that bring all the blue blood coming from the whole body to the right atrium. From there, the blood goes to the right ventricle, and from there it gets pumped to the pulmonary arteries, which take the blood to the lungs to get oxygenated. After the blood gets oxygenated, it comes back to the left side of the heart, to the left atrium, through the pulmonary veins, from there, it goes to the left ventricle, where it gets pumped to the aorta, which distributes oxygenated blood to the whole body, the brain, the abdomen, the kidneys, the extremities. The pulmonary artery and the aorta have gates that are the pulmonary valve and the aortic valve. So 
if we have our patient has an atrial septal defect what where is the problem the problem will be at the level of their inter, in, interatrial septum so that's where most asds are located um, our patient has a special type of asd uh, but for for the sake of um, a description we're we're going to uh, stick to the general asd physiology so what happens when we have an asd um, an asd is a, a hole in the heart it's it's like a window between the left side and the right side. And the flow um, happens depending on the pressures on, each, on the chambers that are communicated through that window. So the left atrium has higher pressures than the right atrium. So usually the blood goes from left to right. Um, so our patient had a left to right shunt. So this is the first of three multiple choice questions. So which chamber gets overloaded and dilates in the presence of an ASD? The answer the, the right ventricle. So let's, let's look at our patient. Um, these are MRI images from our pa that were obtained for our patients, which demonstrate um, that the right ventricle is significantly enlarged. Um, these are cross uh, these are Cross, uh, short axis images of the ventricles. This is the left ventricle and this is the right ventricle here. The right ventricle for reference is, is usually smaller than the left ventricle, but you can see that that's not the case here. We can confirm this by looking at four chamber images. These are the four chambers that we just dis the, discussed in our box diagram. And you can see here the left ventricle the left atrium, the right atrium, and the right ventricle. And as you can see, the right-sided chambers are enlarged. Fortunately, at the time of diagnosis, the function of the right ventricle was still normal. Uh, sometimes long-standing atrial septal defects can lead to dilation and later on to dysfunction of the right ventricle. What are the indications for closure of an atrial septal defect? Is it A, symptoms or impaired functional capacity, right ventricular dilation, a QPQS shunt of greater than 1.5, or a combination of all of the above? And the answer is a combination of all of the above. So going back to our patient, he had symptoms, right? Shortness of breath for quite some time, like Dr. Ellis told you had right ventricular dilation on MRI, and also had a QPQS, as you might remember, over 1.5. And so our patient meets all of the criteria for closure of the defect. What is a contraindication for ASD closure? A, age greater than 70, B, severe pulmonary hypertension, or C, atrial arrhythmias? The correct answer is B, severe pulmonary hypertension. So before we, we, we treat the ASD, we close the ASD, we need to make sure that the pulmonary pressures are, are, are not severely elevated. So that's why this patient was taken to the cath lab uh, for a cardiac catheterization, which confirmed the left to right shunt through the sinus venosus ASD and the anomalous pulmonary vein return. Um, it, it confirmed an elevated QPQS. As you know, the QPQS is a dynamic measurement and depends on many variables. Um, fortunately, the pulmonary vascular resistance, the pulmonary pressures were not elevated and there was no obstructive coronary artery disease, but there were some irregularities in, in eccentric plaques in the right coronary artery. Um, so I'm going to ask Dr. Ellis, Dr. Ellis, what is the importance of checking um, the, for the coronaries prior to an intervention, in this case for an adult congenital heart disease surgery. Yes, uh, coronary artery disease is very prevalent in our society. So before undergoing any open heart procedure, uh, we do a coronary angiogram to screen for underlying coronary artery disease. Fantastic, so after we crossed all of our teeth, um, our patient 
was taken to the operating room and he underwent a sinus venosus defect and par partial anomalous pulmonary vein return repair with a technique called the two-patch technique using autologous pericardium. In addition, he underwent a left atrial clip, um, which helps prevent thrombus formation in the future. He did very well postoperatively and he was able to go home on postoperative day five. Uh, we saw him in clinic a week after discharge and he's doing well, he's walking around the house and he only has mild residual pain. Dr. Ellis, what, what's your experience with congenital heart disease as a leader in your community? Yes, um, I think uh, the congenital heart disease week is very important in uh, making everyone more aware of the prevalence of congenital heart disease. Uh, currently, we're very active in screening for that in our patient population, and we consult routinely with Dr. Lynn and yourself uh, regarding patients that we find in our practice. Thank you everybody for joining us for the Houston Methodist Congenital Heart Awareness Week. Um, learn more from our patients and national experts at the Houston Methodist Adult Congenital Heart Virtual Symposium on November 7. We'll see you there. Thank you for supporting the Houston Methodist Adult Congenital Heart Program.